Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, as the heat goes up, so do the reasons to actually stay out of it once in a while. But uh, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do. Uh, you can listen to the podcast. You can hit that subscribe button. Give us the old five-star rating. Hit that subscribe button. Basically, at all your providers. We're at Amazon, Apple, Spotify, Google. It's pretty much everywhere. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over to our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you want to give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Uh, also, don't hesitate to check us out on the social media. We're on the Facebook, the Twitter, and the Instagram, as the kids call it, at, uh, well... Where else? We're in the seats. Uh, and plus, uh, finally, you know, this is the most important thing. I say it a lot, but it's true. Please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because if we love to write about it uh, and talk about it, uh, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit on. This very special episode, we got a good one. Uh, it's blazing hot where we are here in Toronto and across most of the eastern seaboard and a good part of Canada, I do suspect. So a lot of people are uh, trying to stay in a little bit, do their Netflix and chill, quite literally trying to chill to to stay cool. But uh, for those who don't know, a big show dropped on Netflix this past weekend. It is called The Sandman from... Uh, uh, the Mind of Neil Gaiman, who, you know, they know as a comic book person and generally weird guy and gives us weird stories and lots of fun stuff. But it's a 10-episode it's a limited series, and it is available on uh, Netflix right now. It is, a, it is a hell of a good ride. It is incredibly well done, and you can tell that they put a lot of care uh, into the production of this show because fans of... Genre, science fiction, fantasy, basically anything will will really enjoy this show. It's a uh, it's a healthy dose of uh, a little bit of weird, which uh, is never a bad thing in our estimation. But uh, on that note, we uh, well speaking of no <laughs> note, it's funny I say note, but uh, what we did is we had the unique opportunity of talking with uh, the composer of the show, Mister David Buckley. And uh, talked about sort of composing music for a show like this and how early on he gets involved and the job of a composer and influences and all that kind of fun stuff. It's it's a unique job that uh, a film composer has because, I mean, it essentially starts, you know, them alone at a desk with a keyboard uh, working on some stuff before they sort of build it out, build it out, build it out to the uh, big complex soundscapes that we hear on Shows us like The Sandman, which, like I said, is available streaming now on Netflix, all ten episodes. But uh, before that, as, and if you're a fan of a good musical score for TV and film, uh, check out our talk with David, because uh, between you and me, it's a pretty good one. All right, well, I mean, obviously, first off, just, I mean, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate you coming on. Pleasure, David, pleasure. Now, congrats on the show, man. I mean, I really enjoyed uh, your work on it. But, I mean, my first question is, is, and this is something I'm always kind of curious about, because sort of in film and TV, it really does feel like the composer is is one of the few jobs that they can either come on early on or they can come on kind of after the fact. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, like, at what stage were you, did they bring you into the Sandman to start working on music? Well, it's interesting having, you know, obviously it having been released today, I'm I'm reading quite a lot of the reviews and the commentary on it. And I, I'm picking up things that some of which I, I knew about and some of which I didn't quite realize. And one of the things I didn't really fully appreciate was the huge journey that it's taken to actually get this thing. Well, out. Yeah. well you know, and obviously 30 years ago, when I think the first, <clears throat> you know, attempt at this or, you know, prior to my, I, you know, knowledge of any of this stuff i mean you know this was probably a uh i think i read that the show sort of from writing to end of post-production was probably about a three-year process i think i read that i can't no remember. i think i did too yeah yeah so i would say i started to get involved in about year three okay 
um, which is still a you know in many ways a luxurious amount of time given given television schedules. Um, what I'll say is though, it also it, when I came on board, they were still writing scripts, they were still shooting, and they were still only just began editing. So it wasn't like I came on and there was just like tons of stuff for me to do. But what it critically gave me the time to do was understand what this was because I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not a Sandman before. I'm a big Sandman fan now, but before I worked on the show, I wasn't. It wasn't like I had a Sandman T-shirt or all the comics up on my bookshelf. Right, right. So it gave me an opportunity to to understand both the source material, the Neil's comics, um, and the aesthetic that the show was going for. How faithful they're going to be to comics and how far in their own direction. And it gave me some time to kind of you know try things out and make some mistakes and try and find a tone for what is a quite, you know, a difficult, difficult show. I mean, it's not a straightforward, I'll just do this and then it will work for all 10 episodes. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Does having that time, I mean, allow you to sort of understand, I guess, maybe the creative bent of the show, especially well, allows, when still sort of being assembled? Yes, it, it certainly allows me to real. And what it allowed me to do was rather than just be daunted by the prospect, I was war forewarned that, you know, this was going to be, uh, not say genre hopping, but certainly, you know, we were going to move from episode to episode to episode, and it was going to feel like we're, you know, close to like opening a new book as opposed to a new chapter. Uh, and, you know, when you're told that, you kind of think, oh, all right, okay. And then I watch it, I thought, boy, okay, they really do mean that. We are moving around and really embracing different aesthetics and different dramatic sensations. Um, and what it, rather than just being freaked out by it, which was my initial kind of thought, I was like, oh my God, what do I do? It actually made, I had time to calm myself as well. And I had time to talk to people about it, but well, <laughs> both my family and friends, but spe specifically, you know, the, the creative people on the team, you know, we could really chat about what's required as opposed to, you know, a more brutal television schedule, which I'm quite accustomed to, is right. We want music here, here, and here. Get us your first drafts tomorrow. There was certainly time. I tell you, at the beginning of the schedule, it felt like there was all the time in the world. By a certain point, and it was like, oh my god, how are we going to get this done? So even even the, the the gift of time that was present at the beginning somehow evaporated, and it became um, brutal as things went on. Now, I mean, was a lot of that just back and forth with people like Neil and David? Because, I mean, in watching the episodes that I have so far, I mean, I think what I've really what I really enjoyed about your work here is just that it's not it's very sort of subtle and it's calm and it's not necessarily overwhelming. Like, because, I mean, to me, the two best kinds of scores are either sort of the John Williams bombast or sort mm -hmm. of the the quieter stuff that sort of really elevates the material. And I think your stuff does that here. Yeah. I mean, you know, before, as in any project, before one starts writing i mean when they're even selecting a composer there is there are numerous conversations about music but it can only be speculative because basically the music doesn't exist and yeah. so you could anyone could talk about anything they could say it should be this it should be the other but until you brought someone in who's you know willing and able to start committing things to picture only at that point can you really say yes or no or maybe or more you know that's that's when something tangible is born and 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 um you can get into those kind of discussions having said which it was very clear you know I, one of the reasons that uh, i was very happy to get this job is that i liked the fact that this wasn't an action show i've done so much action over the 15 16 however many years i've been doing this and frankly it's exhausting <laughs> i mean i don't I mean action scores often get really bad raps and you know there's a often some really you know some standout ones possibly one every two years where people think oh god that's a great action score but more often than not they kind of get trashed and it's sort of like forgettable but they don't i think people who slag off action scores don't realize the sheer you know what we're contending with with sound effects and you know big explosions and and you know how do you keep the energy going because i can i swear to god all the all the action scores that get maligned by film score guys you pull that music out and that scene is not half as satisfying as when it's there anyway that's a little rant about action scores. <laughs> i i love the fact that that wasn't what i was being asked to do i was told that we don't need to worry about that yeah there'll be a few moments where we need some pace and 
you know the show is not devoid of action especially if you, you know get all the way through to the end you'll see that you know things do get a little bit more there's a bit more meat on the bone um but this was more i mean uh you know you mentioned neil and david yes they were huge creative forces on the show but their their voices were all funneled through the showrunner alan heinberg who he and i have probably the closest creative conversation throughout it all and he told me that you know this is really about real feelings real human feelings um, and that's really where he wanted me to live musically about the, the the reality of things. And he wanted me to help, you know, we already had good performances. So he wanted me to help just bring those to life, you know, to whatever dynamic um, was necessary from the score. And certainly, thank God, there was no ever and really very little insistence from anyone across the board, Warner Brothers, Netflix, DC, or, you know, any lots of people who had a say here. But mercifully that, you know, the note the composer hates is, oh, can we sting this? Can we hit that? Can we can we make a big meal of this moment? Because it, you suddenly think you're taking the audience for fools. And I don't think we ever really had to do that with the score. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm curious, between TV and film, how does the job change on your end? Because, I mean, I've got to imagine TV must be must be a little more challenging, not just for sort of the time crunch and the demands, but just because things are evolving. It's it's similar music, but there's got to be evolution on it as opposed to sort of this one chunk of a story. Yeah, I mean, when you consider this is, you know, 10 times, I mean, the show's probably by compa comparison to some other stuff, I think, you know, it's probably about no, no longer than 50 minutes that the shows, but that's still 10 times 50 minutes of drama. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's uh... I mean, no, not even the Godfather would, would come to that. I don't yeah, I no, this is like but... This is like, yeah, it's like eight hours and change. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's, it's a huge thing. And because of the nature of the show, I mean, obviously I can get, make, give some spoilers out now because it's out there for people to watch. I mean, you know, we, we go from, an episode one said in 1916, this sort of yeah. someone quite, I thought it was quite a funny little comment. So a few, few reviewers described it as a sort of like murky downtown, Downton Abbey. Um, and, you know, so we got this curious Charles dance character. Um, and then in episode two, we got this cute little guy, this cute little gargoyle called Gregory. Um, in episode three, we're teased into this hellscape where we're actually entering four episode four, five we're in a diner where i mean that's just one hell of an episode if you haven't seen it yet um and musically it's quite different i mean it's not this you know there are some shows i've worked on where we could where i said at the beginning of this video, episode one we could say great you found the tone we could probably put these cues in episode two three four five you can change them up a little right. bit right good absolutely not possible on this every single cue had to be written uh of course there's through lines and thematic identities and, and motifs, but I, there was no opportunity for me to be lazy and say, great, we'll just gra grab those pieces and put them, sprinkle them around. It just, dramatically, it's just not what this show is. It's too, um, well, you know, someone described it, it is, it's almost like the first season is like seven pilots. Yeah. Um, and then at a certain point we get into a, like the back end of the show feels like it's, you know, a, a longer arc. But um, sure. um, so I had to A, acknowledge the diversity of of these opening episodes, but B also kind of knit them all together, so it didn't feel like I, you know, that I, you know, no point. Me, I, I, part of my job was to make it sound homogenous, but not to the extent of blending it out and making the cues sound the same in every episode. Right. So it, it, it was, you know, a difficult exercise in many ways. It, it, what, in, in a job like this, at what stage in the creative process do you actually get to sit down with other musicians, or is it really? Or is there a lot of you sort of in the lab kind of composing and then you take everything and then you're done? Like, what well, is the it, steps of it all? The steps of it all, I mean. Well, this was a, both those approaches, well, I, did, well, I was thinking, I'll, I'll give a succinct answer to that because I think it's obviously, you know, I start here, I've got my keyboard right in front of me and I start kind of messing around with things. And then when I want to bring that to a next level, I will enlist, I've got, you know, over the years, an incredible eclectic band of people who have home studios and microphones. And more often than not, they play an unusual instrument or an instrument, which is very ordinary, in an unusual way. And I'll start kind of combining that with my stuff that I've come up with, bringing, you know, letting, getting them 
perform whatever it may be mixing it into it and all the all the sort of orchestral stuff and choral stuff i i mock up along the way so that the executives can all hear it but then there is this big moment at the end where we go to i mean it was recorded all over europe really um england vienna hungary um missing so sophia um lots of different places and, and then there's this sort of fantastic moment probably i think it's fantastic my mixing engineer probably thinks it's hell on earth but he's downloading all these files from around the globe and filling up this huge session and that's that and then he mixes it i review it with him so you know the, i'm rather like anyone doing what i do for my generation we have to give a very plausible version of it yeah. to the people who sign off on it um you know, in other words, it's got to sound kind. You know, like you can't leave too much to the imagination. Uh, they want to know that if there's a big majestic bit, for example, when Dream walks up to his palace at the end of one, and you know, I think it's at the end of one. It may have moved to the end two. I can't remember, but but he sees this. You know, what was once a glory, his glorious realm, which is now sort of crumbled. I mean, as he was approaching it, we wanted this sense of majesty. It's one of the moments where the score asserts itself. And so I needed them to hear that, you know, that that before I took it to an orchestra, there was no. Yeah, it's going to sound great when we get the band on. You know, it had it had to be kind of demoed and mocked up for them. But that's that's part of, you know, a, comp a composer. I say of my generation, I think there's composers who are a couple of generations above me who probably still have the luxury of saying it's going to sound great on the day. Um, but my, my ilk, we have to program, arrange, orchestrate, mix, produce. It's just, we're called composers, but we have to wear all those hats. Yeah. Now, I mean, what got you into this business? Like was, was film like composing for film and television sort of always the plan for you? Because I mean, it's such a unique job because not only are you obviously making music, which is a creative endeavor in and of itself, but you have to be conscious and knowledgeable of the images that you're matching it to at the same time. I can't, well, I can say that some formative experiences for me, which I think probably planted the seed. One was singing on a, you know, a fantastic movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, uh, and a fantastic score. I sang on that as a, as a child. Oh, wow. And I think, I think that definitely left an impression I'm not going to categorically say that at that moment I knew what I wanted to be, but I will say that it it made my it piqued my curiosity as how music can exist beyond just its own uh, entity that it can join forces with other disciplines and artistic forms and become something new. And I think that definitely stuck with me. Um, and then I was you know I was very lucky to to perform you know in, in that choir that I just mentioned I sang in a, a singer he was at that time a singer came along called Harry Gregson Williams he was a young you know straight out of college hadn't really figured out what he was going to do and he sang for a while and I I was a little bit younger than him but I got to know him a little bit and I think I was quite impressed by how his sort of how he moved from being a singer in an English cathedral to being you know one of the A-listers of Hollywood um you know, I'm not going to tell you that I was a, you know, I love John Williams and um, he is what, one of the greats. Well, it's such an obvious comment. But I wasn't, you know, I know so many of my colleagues sort of reference him as being where it all began. You know, they, they heard his stuff and then it was like a lightning bolt. I, I mean, I, I heard his stuff and I thought it was amazing. But I, I, I think what it is for me is that I'm not a natural performer. So I needed to write... I, and I'm, but I'm a natural musician, so I needed to somehow be musical. Composition seemed like an obvious way. I'm not desperately interested. I wasn't really interested in trying to write concert music because I just felt I like sort of more tonal music. I like stuff with tunes and harmonies, and that sort of led me more into the sort of media world than it did the, the concert hall world. Um, and then as for understanding drama and dramatic sensibilities, I would say... I mean, I think I've just learned on, on the job. I mean, I never studied it. Um, and I now find myself, it's almost a curse now that when I'm watching anything, <laughs> um, you know, trying to sit down with my wife or even with my family to watch a family movie. And I'm now always over and like, how does that work? Why does the cue come in there? Why, oh, what's that? Oh, you know, it's it's like, it, I probably need to watch it three times just to get over the initial over <laughs> analytical nature of my mind. Uh, so. 
No, but you know what? I mean, it's it's one of those things because I mean, it definitely feels like, especially maybe in the past 10, 15 years, sort of the the advent of of the the technologies that are available to guys like you has really pushed uh, sort of the the way people can make scores and and make them more dynamic and make them really interesting and do some interesting stuff. And I mean, we really think you've done that here with this one. But I mean, just to put a bow on this, I'm kind of curious for you. What do you think comes first? Is it like, does the music have to come first or is it about trying to apply something with the technology to make it work? Or what is in the process when you're trying to create a piece? What is like, what is the core thing where you start from? Well, I, you know, if I, when I was making the soundtrack album, I was combing through a lot of music to to kind of condense it down to the, whatever it is, 90 minutes. Eight, I can't remember, just shy of 90 minutes. Probably a bit too long, but I, I gave up. After a while, I thought, I just don't want to kill any more babies. This is... <laughs> this is <laughs> people can always hit skip if they get bored or something. Um, and, you know, and I started... I was kind of remixing it when I made the album because right. when you now don't have dialogue and, and all that kind of annoying stuff getting in the way. <laughs> um, so I can feature things. And, you know, there are, there are lots of, you know, I, I'd say subtle kind of trickeries and and nuances and things that often you know you either feel or they tickle the ear in a in a, in a non-aggressive kind of way and they're all right. they're all you know a lot of time was spent you know even though everything was performed live you know every every note well yeah I say that every note had its origin in a live player um the fact that some of it was tricked out and warped and and weirded up that's another story but that is all to me a little bit secondary. Um, it's a, it's hugely important, um, and in fact, I think it's what for me certainly it's what makes this score. Um, you know, it is you know so many composers have written electronica plus symphonic. That's right. hardly new. In fact, that's the the lingua franca of film scoring these days. That's what everyone does. But this has got. I'd say this leans more towards traditional scoring with a layer of oddity that's yeah. always kind of floating and it's, it sometimes comes in it sometimes comes out and you sometimes don't notice it you sometimes um you, you sometimes i often talk about but just mentioned you sometimes feel it but you don't hear it that was always my intention just to weird things up in a way that just makes the audience do some work and it makes the audience say Hold on, did I just hear a cello or was that something else? And but to answer your question, for me, it all out this is maybe computers and there's it starts here where there's a good old piano and a good old fashioned manuscript paper and a good old fashioned pen. Right. Um, um and that's that's where I like to cut because in that space, I don't feel like I'm on the clock. Yeah. I don't feel like at some point I've got to hit send and it's got to go to a producer and then all hell breaks loose. And all. when I'm in there, it's like, it's not connected to the internet. Um, it's got crappy Wi-Fi signals. So it's right, like, right. I can't even get a phone call in there. And I feel like I can just fumble around on the piano because I'm not, I'm not a particularly good pianist, but I can, I can do something that just feels, even if it's basic, it feels like a musical statement that if I were to, you know, at the end of a dinner party, if someone would say, what was the theme of the Sandman? I could go, there it is, bomb, 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 you know, play it. And then, of course, you know, the, all the colour, all the um, trickery, the playfulness, the the all that stuff comes to life in here. And, of course, with, with the it's orchestra. It's out of that. No, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I, I think that's my general rule of thumb. Um, unless I'm doing an extremely... I mean, I had a... I think it was a couple of years ago. It was during COVID. I can't really remember when anything was then, but it was, it was a pretty brutal film called um my God, I forgot what it was called. It was with Russell Crowe. He was a sort of road rage road oh, rage. Film. Oh, uh, unhinged. Unhinged. Like, thank you for you know, and that they wanted a like a dirty electronic, you know, no no melody, just kind of gnarly score. Um, you know, probably quite rightly, there was nothing poetic in that film. There really um, wasn't. <laughs> it was like pretty kind of grungy. 
And you know, I yeah, there is an argument that could be made that I could have counter programmed and I could have done I could have scored it with harps and flutes, and I think I would have got fired on day two. Um, but that <laughs> that didn't need the piano or the manuscript paper. That just needed some aggression and some some twisted stuff. Um, but I don't get those jobs very often. Probably not a bad thing because they're, they're not the sort of thing. You know, your mum comes around and says, oh, darling, what have you been working on? And you hit play and she sort of walks out of the room. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, piano is where I like to start it. But obviously at some point it's got to, you know, move on from there and, and start becoming a format that um i can start playing to people but i mean you can birth so much just from that and i mean i think you've done that really here and then some and i mean just to put a bow on this it's a dumb question but i gotta ask it desert mm -hmm. island score if you had to pick one what would it be um well it would probably be the same as my desert island film which is the english patient oh good call okay i like that i like that i love that score i, I don't know much about gabriel yared apart from he seems to be a sort of incredibly underused composer um i guess he speaks his mind or something like that i don't i have no idea i i don't know why he does it. i i i just thought that was a sense i loved his because he uses bach within the within the context of the of the movie and with very subtle middle eastern elements really like yeah you know if you were to put that in the hands of someone else it would have been so crass and kind of on the nose but it's just so delicate um and the film is just devastating yeah, um, of course, yeah. Uh, so yeah i i must makes me think that i should find more scores that gabriel yarrod's done but i just i don't know i just don't know what else he's done <laughs> but you know what man just keep doing that delicate work and congrats on this and thank you so much for the time today man this was fun absolute pleasure thanks for having me all right cheers david and don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and blu-ray needs <laughs>